Today we're going to look at the Bible. We're going to look at the books of the Bible, where the manuscripts came from, and what does God think of his word. First of all, the apocryphal books were rejected and denounced by most Jewish rabbis as counterfeit. The Lord Jesus never once quoted or recognized the apocrypha as being scripture, and neither did his apostles. The apocrypha are historical records of what took place, but they are not inspired scriptures. They are much like the writings of Josephus and Philo. We will see that the apocrypha books were added to those with a private agenda at a later date. Next, what does God say about his word? In Matthew 24 and verse 25, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The prophet Isaiah tells us how God regards these people who speak doctrines on their own behalf. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This verse is straight and to the point. God is telling us right now, if anybody speaks not according to his word, it is not done with the Holy Spirit. This is why God asks us to have a readiness of mind, and he asks us to search the scriptures daily, whether things be so. Paul writes in Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ under another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel of heaven, preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul is amazed how quickly people are falling away into error. Paul is telling us in this passage that some would come and pervert the word of God. Now this is important. Please listen to this. Paul is telling us that even if one of the apostles or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto us that they had already preached, let him be accursed. Please note this is past tense. The whole work of salvation was already complete, and the apostles and disciples of Christ chronicled them. Paul is telling us there is no need for any changes, for the full gospel of salvation had already been preached. There is no new information, for God changes not. This puts into sharp contrast the gospel already preached and the new doctrines put forth by the Roman Catholic Church starting in the first century and throughout the next 2,000 years. All the changes, including purgatory, priestly celibacy, indulgences, all the Marian doctrines, confessional boxes, papal infallibility, the so-called real presence of the Eucharist, the priestly class above the laity, confirmation, and infant baptism are all mandates of another gospel. These are all things the Apostle Paul warned us about. So what happened to the Bible after 100 AD? The Old Testament was already assembled and accepted as one book. However, the New Testament letters and gospels were only recently written. Christian churches painstakingly copied and disseminated them. These scrolls were all gathered together in one important city, Antioch of Syria. Antioch was 310 miles north of Jerusalem. From there came the first gospel missionary movement. The Bible tells us the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. These Christian believers collected the Holy Scriptures and made many, many copies. Soon they were collected into a single Bible. This is known as the Northern Stream and later as the Textus Receptus. However, there was another stream. 317 miles southwest of Jerusalem lies the city of Alexandria, Egypt, and it was in that city the so-called intellectuals perverted the word of God. Because of their pagan philosophical educations, they began changing the manuscripts. They argued about what to include, what to exclude, and what to change. Satan used these so-called intellectuals in Egypt to confound and mutilate the Old and New Testaments of God, and the mess they produce is called the Alexandrian Manuscripts. They argued like mad in Egypt for years, but the one man who had the biggest influence was named Origen. Origen didn't like God's preserved Bible of the Northern Stream. The Northern Stream was penned by first-hand accounts and word-by-word reaccounts. During his life, Origen wrote over 2,000 books, all of which were infected by his pagan Greek philosophy. They were also infected with his way of interpreting the Bible. His main point? God didn't really mean what he said. Origen was not a true Bible believer. He did not believe in the Old Testament miracles. He did not believe in many of Jesus' stories or words. He did not believe the Holy Spirit is eternal. And he certainly did not believe Jesus Christ was Almighty God veiled in flesh. He made changes. He deleted passages, inserted New Testament verses into the Old Testament, 
Satan used unbelieving origin to make his first counterfeit Bible, adding and removing what he wanted. This southern manuscript is the foundation of Jerome's Latin Vulgate of the Roman Catholic Church. It is ironic that the church in which his teachings were foundational officially anathematized him for fifteen heretical counts at the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 545 A.D. Satan attacked both the Word of God and the believers in Christ through horrible persecutions, but the New Testament manuscripts were being carefully copied by Christians and successfully hid to preserve them. This was the Bible of the true Christian church. Now this is not referring to the Roman Catholic Church. Church literally means a chosen or called out assembly. It is not viewed as an external organization, denomination, or hierarchical system. The New Testament Church, therefore, is a local autonomous congregation or assembly of simple believers, which is a church in and of itself. The true Christian Church, therefore, follows the teachings of Jesus Christ and Holy Scriptures without condition. Reading and applying God's teachings into your lives, you meet the biblical definition and are a part of Christ's true Church. Pope Innocent III stated in 1199, Usually, in fact, scriptures cannot be understood by everyone but only those who are qualified to understand them with informed intelligence. The depth of the divine scriptures is such that not only the illiterate have difficulty understanding them, but also the educated and the gifted. In 1229 A.D., the Bible was placed on the forbidden books by the Synod of Toulouse. Not only that, but the house of the so-called heretic in which the Bible was discovered was instructed to be burned. The Council of Tarragona in 1234 ruled that no one may possess the books of the New and Old Testaments in the Romance language. If anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after enactment of this decree. John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, was the very first to translate the entire Bible into English, which he completed in 1382. Wycliffe translated from the Latin Vulgate, and they were painstakingly reproduced by hand. At the Ecumenical Council of Constance in 1415, Wycliffe was condemned forty years after his death. His bones were dug up, publicly burned, and thrown into the River Swift. In 1546, during the Council of Trent, the Vatican had declared the Apocrypha was Holy Writ, and officially part of their Old Testament canon. Anybody rejecting this was damned as a heretic and burned at the stake. This dangerous law is still in effect and reaffirmed by Vatican II. The Roman Catholic Council has to include these books because of obscure passages that minimally at best lay the foundation for the devil doctrine of purgatory. Pope Pius IV had a list of the forbidden books compiled and officially prohibited the Old and New Testaments be read by the laity in the Index of Trent of 1559. On May 5th of 1824, Pope Leo VII condemned the Bible as being harmful. Quote, Do everything possible to see that the faithful observe strictly the rules of our congregation of the Index. Convince them that to allow holy Bibles in the ordinary language, wholesale and without distinction, would on account of human rashness cause more harm than good. End quote. Satan intensified the war by creating the horrible Inquisition. The Word of God was the number one target. Home of the Christians were torn apart brick by brick looking for the Textus Receptus, which is the name given to the preserved Word of God. Satan engineered unbelievable tortures and violent deaths at the hands of his counterfeit church, which claimed over 50 million victims, and it was all done in the name of our Lord. Roman Catholic author Peter de Rosa, who wrote on the atrocities of the Roman Catholic torture machine, said, the record of the Inquisition would be embarrassing for any organization. For the Roman Catholic Church, it is devastating. Today, it prides itself on being the defenders of natural law and the rights of man. The papacy, in particular, likes to see itself as the champion of morality. What history shows us is that, for more than six centuries without a break, the papacy was the sworn enemy of elementary justice. Of eighty popes in a line from the 13th century on, not one of them disapproved of the theology and apparatus of the Inquisition. On the contrary, one after another added his own cruel touches to the working of this deadly machine. King James ordered a Bible be drafted from the original Texas Receptus manuscripts. King James had stationed guards while the 47 scholars diligently attended to their work. They oversaw every move that was made, so no shenanigans took place. King James mandated that checks and balance was to be implemented on every verse. This version of the Bible used the most intellectual minds of their time. Every comma, every word, every definition was checked and rechecked. The King James Version of the Bible was completed, and God once again kept his promise by preserving his word.